You're listening to Milwaukee Mafia, your podcast dose of Wisconsin Mafia and true crime history. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Milwaukee Mafia. I'm Eric. I'm Gavin. Gavin, we're back with our last episode before vacation trip, right? Well, are is it? Are we taking a break or just just you going on vacation? Well, I'm going on vacation, which means you get a break from podcasting. Yeah, right? that's true. It, yes. So it's like Gavin, when I go on vacation, Gavin gets vacation. Yeah, too. but the but the so, listeners don't notice no, that. No, they do not notice okay. that. Yeah. What do you got for us today? Some episodes we're going to do, um, I'm going to be calling, who was that guy? <laughs> and uh, and this is one of those episodes. This is a who was that guy episode. And these are generally going to be shorter because they're guys that we don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is this is about the dry cleaning business in Milwaukee. Not what you think. It's not about a scam with dry cleaning. No. Okay. And it's about a guy named Gus Marzullo. Yeah, basically, who is this guy? I don't know. So is this tentatively somebody that people speculate was a mafia-associated person, but there's really no evidence to show that? Or where where are we headed? I don't think he's a mafia guy. Just just to be cleared up front, I don't think he is. But he's definitely, like, he's associated, as you'll see. He's very connected. He's connected. So, like, I don't know where this guy came from, what his deal is. Very clear right up front. I don't think that he was a mob guy. I don't think he was involved in anything super shady. Um, But just like, who was this guy? Why was he hanging out with these guys? Okay. All right, we'll take it away. All right, so we're starting in 1962 today. Phone line was installed at Unity Cleaners, the dry cleaner, on South 1st Street in Milwaukee. The business had recently gone into receivership um, and was purchased by our friendly local mafia guys, Joe Guerrera and Buster Balistrieri. These are the two guys who got sent from Kansas City to Mm -hmm. handle gambling in Milwaukee. Now, what they did is they continued to run this as a dry cleaning business, but these guys don't know anything about dry dry cleaning. cleaning. (laughs) So what... Their interest in it is, is they're using it as a drop-off spot for the bookies in town. Okay. Instead of them going around to the bookies and collecting money, they're now going to make the bookies come to the dry cleaning shop. <laughs> and pay their bill. And pay stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the FBI is running surveillance. Even the police are running surveillance. They're basically seeing known bookies, known gamblers coming and going. Some of them bringing laundry. So they, they might be really doing their laundry, or they might just be like using laundry bags to disguise, you know, what they're carrying around with them. But this was an actual laundry shop. People could get their dry cleaning done there. This is going on. Then here comes our guy of the week, Gus Marzullo. Uh, and his name is actually Cosmo Marzullo, but he went by Gus. Don't okay. know why, but we're going to call him Gus because that's what he called himself. He's 58 years old. He lives on South 5th Street in Milwaukee. And he's picked up on December 5th, 1962. So this is, you know, six, seven months after this shop opens. Patrolman Rocky Todd, which is a great name. (laughs) Rocky Todd uh, pulls him for running a red light. And then he's unable to prove that the car that he's driving belongs to him. It did. He had not yet transferred his license plates, so... Uh, The plates came up looking wrong. He told the assistant district attorney, Hugh O'Connell, that he had recently bet $850 on the horses. In fact, he had bet that much just that very day. And uh, this this, this question that came out of when he got pulled over, they saw racing forms in his car. So they're asking about his gambling. He's like, yeah, I bet $850 on the horses today. Um, He said, my job is I work for the dry cleaning company. I'm the manager there. Previously owned three laundromats as well as a laundromat supply store. So he's like, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And he goes, the business, I know the business is owned by Steve DeSelvo, Buster Balistrieri, and and, uh, Joseph Guerrera. I don't know anything about these guys. I just know that they're my bosses and they sign my checks. He said, I've been interested in horse racing all my life. I've been studying horse racing for the last 14 years and I've found a way to win at horse racing 97% of the time. <laughs> That's pretty good odds, man. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, in fact, 
What I've done is I've pooled $4,700 from six businessmen in Racine to take their money and bet on the horses. He's very, very forthcoming here. <laughs> He's just selling his whole gambling but thing. Now, but to be clear, though, at this point in time, the horse racing thing is legal, right? Yes. Okay. So it's not like he's he's admitting to any crimes by any. Not means. really. No. Like if he if he went to a bookie in town, that is not legal. But if he goes down to a Chicago, yeah, yeah, and he and he's doing you know off track betting, I'm fairly confident that was legal at this time. Okay. So yeah, it's not necessarily illegal, depending on how he's doing when, it. Right. When I tried to look into Marzullo's background. It took some real digging. He doesn't really come up in the newspapers. He doesn't really come up in records a whole lot. But I did, I did, I was able to find some. I was able to find some stuff. All right. Okay. Um, We know that he was born in Italy on May 4th, 1904. He arrived in America on June 12th, 1920. Uh, He came through New York City, which is pretty normal. On July 13th, 1928, he was naturalized in Chicago, meaning he became a citizen. His witnesses to become a citizen were Vito Marzullo, same last name, Mm -hmm. and Antonio Gasparro. He continued to live in Chicago at least up through 1940, where he worked as a foreman in a shoe factory. Nothing really jumps out here as unusual. Like This Mm -hmm. is very mundane, normal story here. Even the neighborhoods he's living in aren't like, you know, really heavily Italian Sicilian neighborhoods. So he's not even like growing up around these other guys. The one interesting thing out of this, and this is like, this is a bit of a stretch, but the one interesting thing is that the witness, Vito Marzullo, who I presume is a relative, but I could not prove it, Vito Marzullo. Uh, was actually a Chicago alderman, and they said he ruled, this is the newspaper, he ruled the West Side 25th Ward virtually unchallenged from 1953 to 1985. Wow, that's a long time. Yes. Um, he was said to be second only to Richard J. Daly, the mayor, in representing the machine politics of Chicago. <laughs> And if you go online, like, you can actually find a lot. Like, this guy is a pretty big name. And there's, like, even video of him. There's a video of him that's, like, an hour long. And I did not watch the whole thing. (laughs) But, like, it's him sitting in a city park. And people are coming up to him. And they're, like, getting jobs. They're like, hey, I need a job. He's like, okay, you work for the street department now. <laughs> and he's like, and he's like handing out jobs to people. <laughs> it's really weird. But that's but that's how it worked in Chicago. Like it was called patronage. It might still be called patronage. I don't know if that's still a thing in Chicago or not, but it was. And yeah, like We've talked about in the past, like the aldermen in Chicago have a ridiculous amount of power. And one of those things is like they can basically just put people in positions to work in their ward. So, oh, hey, my my friend wants to wants to be the superintendent of something. All right. You're in charge now. And it's totally legal. Like this is just how things were. Nobody thought it was weird. And that makes a lot of sense on how they ended up with so much corruption. Yes. In Chicago. Absolutely. With this model, if they're bringing in all their friends, it's just, it increases the chances of some oh, illegal 100%. shit happen. A hundred percent. Yeah. Now, to be clear, I want to say this Vito Marzullo guy, although he was very powerful, he was a part of the democratic machine in Chicago, he was never really considered like corrupt. Like he wasn't investigated for any like scandals or anything like that. So he's not a questionable guy. I mean, what he's doing is just the normal course of business. So he's not doing it in in any more shady way than anybody else else was doing. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, absolutely. That's, I think that's a a huge part of where the corruption comes from from. (laughs) because yeah, when you, when you can hand out like city jobs to whoever you want to hand them out to, eh, you know, it's, that's not very good structure. That's not very good checks and balances, and things can just get abused. Very things easily. can get abused, and and 
you know, when you're hiring people based on who you know rather than on any kind of merit, it's not really – they're probably not the right person for the job. That's whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's way outside of what we're doing here. Getting back to our guy, Gus. So we know Gus was in the dry cleaning business at least as far back as 1948. The reason I know this is because in 1948 – Two fur coats were stolen from a dry cleaning business that, that was run by him. <laughs> um, this store was in Racine, Wisconsin. So by 48, he had moved from Chicago to Racine and got into dry cleaning. How from 48 to 1962, he got from Racine to Milwaukee and ended up working at a place run by these guys. That's the part I don't know. Mm-hmm. And that's the part that makes this guy mysterious to me. Because it it could be just a completely random thing where it's like, okay, you've run dry cleaning stores. We need a guy to run our dry cleaning store. That might be the whole story. Mm-hmm. It it seems to me that like the, there might be like one extra piece missing out of this. Because if you're going to have a place where you're hanging out and you're having bookies bring in money from illegal gambling all day, you kind of want the guy running it to be cool with that. Yeah, I mean, and I think it would be very hard to hide that yeah. from him, right? Yeah. I mean, he's going to be aware that, okay, there's something weird going on here if if that's happening while yeah. he's there. So I don't know. And, and again, maybe it's just as simple as they knew like that he hung out at the horse track. So they're like, oh, this guy's cool. I and don't know. That that's where because does he have any connection to Milwaukee mafia members besides the people that own and I guess the people that outside own of it, this store, absolutely you know not. No. So I'm almost thinking that one of these people met him at, at a track. Yeah. And they made a relationship and they said, Hey, do you want in on we're buying a laundry mat, we're looking for a manager for it that knows yeah. what they're doing and they brought him in. And maybe he was willing to look the other way at the gambling thing because he was such an avid gambler himself. Yeah. Know? Yeah. But. I mean, that's, I, I think it's probably something really simple. It's just, I wish I knew what that missing piece was. And that's why this is an episode where, who is that guy? It's kind of a mystery guy. And and we'll have future episodes where it's just like, what's going on here? And the, the answer most of the time is probably, it's innocent. It's a coincidence. It's whatever. Things you got to explore. So mm-hmm. we're going to explore them. Um, A man named Orville Olson was interviewed by the U.S. Marshal's Office in December 1962 about Gus. Uh, He said he had known Gus for many years and that Gus had a successful cleaning business. One day, roughly five months ago, Marzullo approached him at Olson's business, which was Peerless Cleaners in Racine County, and said that he had a sure way of beating the horses. Olson gave him $300, and he soon gave him $700 more. Since that time, Marzullo had returned $320 to Olson. His understanding was that he could ask for his full thousand dollars back at any time, but he had not yet tried to do so as long as Gus kept paying him bit by bit. He knew several other men who had also invested in this horse betting plan. So right here, if you've bet a thousand dollars on a sure thing and you've got three hundred dollars back, that doesn't sound great. But okay, go with it. Owen Madsen, owner of the Western Auto Store, was also interviewed and said he gave Marzullo one thousand dollars and had received two hundred and fifty four dollars back. Madsen had met Marzullo, Gus, through Olson and was told essentially the same story, that he could get his money back at any time, um, but he had not tried to do so yet. The officer interviewing him said, you know, this this really sounds like a con game here. <laughs> um, but they said, you know, no, 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 no. This is like, I'm getting paid my money, so it's not a con game. Let me tell you, this stuff absolutely sounds like a con <laughs> game to me. It sounds like you take $1,000 from... From a guy, you take a thousand dollars from the second guy, you give three hundred of the second thousand to the first guy, and you just keep getting more guys. We call that a Ponzi scheme. You're right. That's like you you said in there, 
none of these people had actually tried to get their money back, right? Right. So you don't really know if he might have just been able to bring give them their money. Maybe he is winning horses 98% of the time, yeah. and he's just sitting on a huge pile of cash. Yeah. And no, none of the, his investors are asking for their money back yet, so he's just compounding it. We don't it, know that. Yeah. But it does sound like it could very well be a Ponzi scheme, it, too. It's, <laughs> that's how it sounds to me, but we don't know. We don't know what ends up happening. And although he was not investigated for this, I should point out that my understanding, and somebody can definitely correct me, but my understanding of the law here is if he's taking a bet from these guys in Racine and then going down to Chicago and betting on the horses, that That's in itself it. is illegal. Yeah, probably. Because he's because he's carrying a wager across, which is... So dumb because the way you're like, it's not even like a physical thing. You're but, right. You're right, Gavin. But at the same time, I mean, they could just say, well, no, I, I wasn't carrying his bet across state lines. I was just carrying. He borrowed me money. Yeah. And and I'm sure that's not illegal. And they can't really argue that. Right. You know, they can't unless he like was writing out documents that clearly stated this was for betting. A- absolutely. I yeah. Like, so, I, I think strictly speaking, it would be illegal, but it would be really hard to prove it because yeah. like. If you just say, hey, if you go down to the track today, could you throw 50 bucks on a horse for me? It's really hard to prove that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the FBI interviewed a man named Fred Klanknick. And sorry, Mr. Klanknick, if that's not accurate. So it does not sound very accurate. <laughs> but it's what it looks like. So that's what it looks like. K-L-A-N-C-N-I-K. Klanknick. Okay. That, can't ar- argue with that one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, The FBI interviewed him about Gus. Uh, He said that he had known Gus for many years because they were both in the dry cleaning business. Klanknick said that he was unemployed for a while when Marzullo invited him to work for the dry cleaning business in Milwaukee. While there, the paychecks were signed by Steve DeSelva. He had heard that Buster Balistrieri and Joseph Guerrero had an interest, but they were not the ones that signed his checks. Klanknick said the business was completely legitimate as far as he knew, and in fact, it was rather successful because it had primarily commercial accounts, meaning they were dry cleaning like hotels and businesses that would need that sort of thing. They had one Ford Econoline van, which was registered in Klanknick's name. He had never seen anything related to gambling on the property. Nothing super weird there, except if you're a super successful business, and all you have is one van, and it's in your employee's name. <laughs> that, of that's a little weird. Name. Yeah, I would agree. That's not. That doesn't sound to me like a super successful business. <laughs> that's a little bizarre. Yes. Yeah, I would agree with you. But, but maybe now again, when is this? Sixty-two. Eh, maybe that was normal. Maybe, maybe that was normal. Maybe dry cleaners. You know, you people use their own vehicles to carry to transport. The drivers had to use their own vehicles. Yes. You know. Yes. Papa John's is a very successful pizza place, but they that don't have any any of their own vehicles. They just use their employees' vehicles. That is absolutely true. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. February 1963, less than a year after they take over the dry cleaning business, the IRS padlocks the dry cleaning business for failure to pay withholding taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I feel like we've heard this story before. <laughs> yes. And that's the last we hear... Of the dry cleaning business. (laughs) (laughs) The door never gets unlocked again, huh? Apparently, they they pay it, they get it unlocked, but that's it. Then they just apparently just don't continue with business after that. They just clear clear their debts and they're done. I don't know. (laughs) Did they just say, we'll try something else? I don't know. Whatever happened, they ran this for about a year and they were like, nope, we're we're done. It seems like an ongoing theme during this time is is that they just kind of jump onto something, ride it for a little while, and then just quit. Yeah. Well, usually it ends up badly, and then they it gets all busted up. Yeah, this is relatively minor. I don't know what the amount of the taxes they owed was. I can't imagine it's like that much, mm-hmm. because it doesn't seem like they had a lot of people working for them. But either way, our main guy this time, Gus... Gus Marzullo, died in Milwaukee, August 1978. In his early life, his wife's name was Julia. Later on, his wife's name was Helen. 
I don't think his wife changed her name. <laughs> so gonna... so apparently uh, at some point his wife either died or they divorced and he got remarried. <laughs> you really um, set that up well. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is on like the records. On some records, his wife listed as Helen, and sometimes it's Julia. And I don't think that's the same person. I, I don't think so either. But I couldn't find any record of her dying or, or a divorce. He had no children. So yeah, after the striking business goes under, never hear of Gus again. It's really interesting because when you listen to the story, so now I said earlier that I think, well, there's no way Gus could have not known that this was going on in the dry cleaner. Yeah. But then you just talked about that Clinknick guy. Yeah. He, they even interviewed him and asked him, like, yeah. did you ever see gambling going on? And he said no. So maybe they were clever about this, that this clink, this other yeah. the Gus might not have ever known that this was even going on. It's possible. I mean, there wasn't any gambling happening there. Right. They were just it was collecting ju- the money. Right. Which you still would figure, like, why are all these people walking in here with yeah. and paying something when they're not, you know? Yeah. But maybe they just had a clever system. That maybe could, they did. It I could escape the guy pure, completely. I... I have my doubts. I mean, I would find it more believable that the guy knew what was going on and didn't care than the guy didn't have any idea. Yeah, yeah, and I think I would lean that direction, too. (laughs) Just because I do, he obviously was a very avid gambler. For them to say, like, well, we have people coming in here and paying for gambling bets or whatever, he probably... That's in his mind. That's probably like I don't care about that because I like gambling. So, yeah. So yeah. Like, he probably realized it was illegal, but he didn't. It was one of those things where yeah, he thought it was dummy legal. So he was like, "Yeah, go for it." Yeah. I think that this character, in my opinion, he falls under to one of those characters, and I think we talked about it on the last last podcast where mm. every once in a while the mafia needs somebody that's yeah. kind of on the outside, and I think this guy more or less falls into that. Yes. That category where he was not directly tied, did not honestly have any relationship with the mafia other than the fact that he was a manager at a business they owned. I absolutely agree. I I don't think there's anything really going on with with Gus Marzullo. It's just just the face of the business. But, you you know, that's why you got to look into these things. But, yeah, based on what I know, I would give him a pass. I would say, you're okay. You're all right. And you did, did you... Research enough to find out, did once they bought this laundromat, Mm -hmm. did they hire this guy or did this guy come along with the laundromat? I don't think he was already there. You know, okay. I don't believe so. It wasn't, it wasn't completely clear um, because, you know, they bought it after it was in receivership, but I didn't get the impression that it was Gus's store that they bought. Mm Mm-hmm. Or I, but, I, but I, I believe they hired him on. They hired him on. And I'm my gut would go towards that one of them had a relationship with him from gambling. Yeah. And said, hey, I know you got experience in this. We've just bought a business. Would you be interested in running it? And he probably just said, sure. Yeah. So, And if anybody knows anything more, let me know. But that's the story as I know it. Who was Gus Marzullo? Just some guy. Just some guy. Just some Vandal- guy who who was in dry cleaning business and, and liked betting on horses. Yeah. <laughs> and was probably ripping off his friends, but <laughs> but we don't know. We don't know. He claimed to have a, what was it, 97% success rate? 97% success rate on betting on horses, which pretty sure is impossible. Possible, yeah. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I, wish, I wish there was a way that we could, like, see that. Yeah. Like, like if, like, all bet, horse betting races was public knowledge or something that you yeah. could go see what this guy bid on and see if he was how yeah. often he was winning but yeah i don't know how you could pull that off all right well i don't have anything else so i think we can wrap this episode yeah up. that's it oh. this one's this one can be pretty short because it's not a, like a not a major scheme or anything just a little piece Look. of the giant you know you, you find you find little stories everywhere right. this is just a little one with that we thank everybody for tuning in and remind you again that we do have a patreon you can jump over at that at patreon.com slash Milwaukee Mafia, as yes. well as a mailing list, which you can find at MilwaukeeMafia.com. Yes. And we will be back next week. Or actually, Gavin, why don't you hit them with contact info? Yes. You can uh, find the website, MilwaukeeMafia.com, um, where I post uh, all the notes. So you, the stuff that I'm skimming over on uh, on the air here, you can actually read in detail if you're curious. 
you can email me directly. Any comments, complaints, questions, milwaukeemafia at gmail.com. I also encourage you to go to the mailing list. Uh, it's super simple. All you do is go to the website, and it's right at the very top. It's probably the first thing you see is join the mailing list. And we don't spam you. You get something once a month just letting you know what episodes are coming up and and a few odds and ends. So it's not annoying. <laughs> I mean, unless you're really easily annoyed, it's it's not one of those annoying mailing lists. <laughs> with that, we'll wrap this episode up and we'll be back next week with a new Patreon episode as well as two weeks with a new Milwaukee Mafia episode. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Milwaukee Mafia podcast. Join us next time for another look back at Wisconsin Mafia and true crime history.